Archaeologists have made some truly astonishing discoveries over the years, but there's reason to believe that their best work is still to come. We say that because incredible archaeological discoveries are still made all over the world every month of every year. As proof of that, here's a whole video full of wonderful, recent archaeological finds. We're starting in the ancient city of Assos, located on Turkey's Aegean coast, where archaeologists have unearthed a Roman lead weight that tips the scales at an impressive 11.3 ounces, or approximately 320 grams. This find is the largest of its kind ever discovered, and dates back to the 2nd century BCE. The weight bears intricate carvings of a griffin, a mythological creature with the body of a lion and the head and wings of an eagle. This fascinating artifact was found near a Roman fountain, which itself was discovered last year. The weight serves as a testament to the meticulous practices of trade and measurement that thrived in Assos's bustling marketplace. Professor Nuritin Arslan, who led the excavation, highlights that these weights held city-specific significance and were primarily used for trade. The discovery adds another layer to our understanding of Assos, a city with a rich history that spans multiple civilizations, including the Greeks, Romans, and Byzantines. The ongoing excavations, which have been taking place for 42 years, continue to shed light on various structures and artifacts, enriching the narrative of this ancient city. Next, we have the gripping tale of a 3,800-year-old cuneiform clay tablet discovered at the Bronze Age site of Tel Achana in southern Turkey. This ancient artifact was found during restoration work following a devastating earthquake. The tablet is inscribed in Akkadian and serves as a contract for the acquisition of another city by the king of Alalak, the largest city in the region during the Middle and Late Bronze Age. Alalak was a hub of commerce and culture, strategically situated on trade routes connecting Anatolia, Mesopotamia, Egypt, and the Mediterranean. The city was abandoned in the 13th century BCE, leaving behind a mound of 22 hectares in area and about 30 feet high. The tablet was found when the team removed rubble from a collapsed wall and is considered an extremely unique example to understand the economic and political models of that period. This discovery raises several intriguing questions. What does this tablet reveal about the economic power and political reach of ancient Alalak? How did the concept of city acquisition work in ancient times? And what were the legalities involved? Could there be more hidden treasures waiting to be discovered in the ruins of Tel Achana? In the tranquil village of Amanbaev in Kyrgyzstan, a trio of brothers and their friend recently unearthed a medieval marvel, a saber sword that has been aptly named the Kyrgyzstan Saber. This 12th century weapon, with its graceful curved blade, showcases the pinnacle of medieval craftsmanship. The saber measures about 36 inches in total length, with a blade stretching to approximately 30 inches. Alongside the saber, the excavation also revealed a smelting vessel, coins, and a dagger, painting a vivid picture of a once thriving workshop. The saber's design suggests Iranian origins, and its curvature is akin to the famed Shamshir sabers of the Indo-Iranian region. Although the saber is the star discovery, the coins are also prompting interest from archaeologists. One of them featured Arabic inscriptions on both sides, and is thought to have been minted within the Karakhanid state during the 11th century. For it to be in Kyrgyzstan suggests that the borders of these Arab states might have changed during that, or the following century, as these particular coins weren't previously thought to have been circulated or used as currency in Kyrgyzstan. In the 2,000-year-old House of the Amphitheater, also known as the Casa del Anfiteatro in Merida, Spain, Archaeologists have unearthed the well-preserved remains of a massive public bath area. The house, built by the Romans in a colony they called Augusta Emerita, contained baths of an extraordinary size for a standard Roman house. These baths would have belonged to a private residence, 
or perhaps a set of private residences, but they would have been widely shared, hence they could still be labeled as public baths. It's even possible that the baths might have been a focal point of grand parties held by the property's owner. And by parties, we're sure you can all imagine what we actually mean. The bathing area featured individual bathing facilities in excellent condition, along with ample wall and floor decorations, including marble plaques, moldings, paintings, and various underground structures associated with the baths. The House of the Amphitheater is part of the Archaeological Ensemble of Merida, recognized as a World Heritage Site by UNESCO in 1993. This discovery offers a fascinating glimpse into the luxurious lifestyle of the Roman elite in ancient Spain. Imagine the delight of opening a dusty cupboard and finding a 114-year-old card game completely by chance in Castle Donington, Leicestershire, England. That's precisely what happened when a Hanson auctioneer's appraiser found a complete set of Panko or Votes for Women cards a game designed to promote the suffragist cause. Named after Emmeline Pankhurst, a feminist icon and a leader of the UK's women's suffrage movement, the cards feature illustrations of women activists and their government and legal system opponents. Created by punch political cartoonist Edward Tennyson Reed and published in 1909, the game was sold for two shillings. Its primary aim was to advocate for women's suffrage in middle-class domestic settings, where more militant approaches would have been frowned upon. The cards are in excellent condition and are considered quite rare, found in only a few libraries and institutions. This game not only served as a unique form of activism, but also provides a fascinating glimpse into the social and political climate of the early 20th century. Pankhurst's cause might not have been popular with the political leaders of the country at the time, but it was clearly popular with the people. In the tranquil waters of Leo Piccolo, a village just north of Venice, Italy, archaeologists from Ca Foscari University discovered a precious agate gemstone engraved with an unknown mythological figure. This underwater find is particularly rare, and suggests that the area was frequented by wealthy Romans, who likely treated it as a vacation resort. The gemstone was found alongside a structure with a brick base and oak walls, submerged 11 feet below the water surface. Initially thought to be used for oyster conservation and farming, this structure was later identified as a holding tank for oysters before consumption. The site also revealed fragments of valuable frescoes and black-and-white mosaics, which led to the interpretation that it could have been a prestigious villa. This discovery not only adds to the rich tapestry of Roman history in the area, but also provides valuable markers for studying sea-level variations and local subsidence. The gemstone and the surrounding artifacts offer a fascinating glimpse into the luxurious lifestyle and advanced engineering capabilities of ancient Romans. As for the identity of the figure on the gemstone, experts are working on it. Step into the Valley of the Temples, an archaeological wonder in Agrigento, Sicily, where recent excavations have unearthed a fascinating collection of votive offering figurines. This ancient city, founded around 582 to 580 BCE by Greek colonists, is a UNESCO World Heritage Site and boasts some of the finest edifices of ancient Greek civilization, including the Temple of Concordia and the Temple of Juno. The discovery of over 60 figurines, along with protomes, female busts, oil lamps, small vases, and bronze fragments, was made in a housing complex north of the Temple of Juno. These artifacts were found above the destruction layers of the house, suggesting they were deposited after the city was sacked by the Carthaginians in 406 BCE. That means that they could be votive offerings, although it's also possible that they were left as a tribute to the people who perished in the sacking. This find not only enriches our understanding of the religious and cultural practices of ancient aggregentum, but also provides insights into the dynamics of the city's destruction. It's a vivid reminder of how, even in times of chaos and upheaval, 
the human spirit finds ways to express devotion and hope. Just four weeks into the excavation of Mile Castle 46 on Hadrian's Wall in Northumberland, England, archaeologists have stumbled upon a fascinating relic, a small equal-arm steel-yard beam from an ancient Roman scale. Now, for a bit of context. Mile castles were little forts constructed every Roman mile along defensive frontier walls. There were once 80 of them dotting Hadrian's Wall, with Mile Castle 46 situated just north of the Magna Fort. The discovery of this steel yard beam is particularly intriguing. Measuring about 9 inches, this copper alloy beam had a decorative central fulcrum hole for a suspension chain. One end of the beam showcased a triple bevel design and a delicate suspension hole where a weighing pan would have been hung. The other end? That was for hanging small weights. This steel yard was likely used by a skilled Roman tax official or merchant to weigh precious items passing through the Mile Castle. Given its location at a junction of three major Roman roads, Mile Castle 46 was perfectly positioned for tax and control. Imagine the bustling activity of ancient traders, the clinking of Roman coins, and the weight of history that this steel yard has witnessed. We're about to delve into the eerie life of Vlad the Impaler, the infamous 15th century voivode of Wallachia and inspiration for Bram Stoker's Dracula. A recent study has added another layer of mystique to this already enigmatic figure. A chemical analysis of three letters penned by Vlad revealed that he likely suffered from a rare condition known as hemolacria, which causes one to cry tears of blood. Researchers used mass spectrometry to examine the letters, picking up 500 peptides, 100 of which were of human origin and presumably from Vlad himself. These peptides were tied to ciliopathies, genetic disorders affecting cellular cilia and suggested he may have had a respiratory tract infection. Most intriguingly, peptides found in a letter from 1475 were linked to proteins of the retina and tears, leading to the conclusion that Vlad may have suffered from hemolacria. While the exact cause remains unknown, it could be related to an eye injury or bacterial conjunctivitis. This groundbreaking research not only sheds light on Vlad's health, but also adds a new dimension to our understanding of this historical figure, who was responsible for the demise of more than 80,000 people through impalement. Picture this. Students at the University of Marburg in Germany are excavating the site of a church when they stumble upon a pocket-sized marvel, a medieval sundial dating from the 16th century. This sundial, crafted from bronze and wood, is about the size of a matchbook and could easily fit in the palm of your hand. Dr. Felix Teichner, who led the excavation, lauded the find as a sensational glimpse into the intersection of astronomy, mathematics, and craftsmanship during the transition from the Middle Ages to modern times. The sundial likely belonged to a member of the Brethren of the Common Life, a religious community that resided in a monastery on the church grounds starting in 1527. Sundials have been around since at least 1500 BCE, first developed in China, Babylon, and Egypt. By the 17th century, pocket sundials had become quite common in Europe. This particular sundial was found in what was likely the monastery's rubbish dump, alongside other intriguing artifacts that are yet to be examined. It serves as a fascinating reminder of how people in bygone eras kept track of time, much like we do today with our wristwatches and smartphones. Archaeologists have made a phenomenal discovery in northwestern China, unearthing an elaborate leather horse saddle that may be the oldest of its kind ever found. The saddle was found in the tomb of a woman in Yanghai, located in the Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region. Dating back approximately 2,700 years, the saddle is believed to have been made between 724 and 396 BCE using two cowhide cushions filled with a mixture of straw, deer, and camel hair. This finding suggests that the history of saddle making may have started earlier than previously thought. 
What makes this discovery even more intriguing is its potential predating of saddles known from the Scythians, who were nomadic horse riders from the western and central Eurasian steppe. While the earliest known Scythian saddles are believed to date from the 5th to 3rd centuries BCE, this newly found saddle may have been crafted even earlier. The Yanghai tombs, where the saddle was discovered, are associated with the Shubeishi culture that occupied the Turpan Basin region around 3,000 years ago. The saddle's positioning in the tomb, with the woman seemingly seated on it, suggests that she was a rider. This finding challenges traditional narratives that associate horse riding with elite male warriors, offering evidence of women's participation in the day-to-day -day activities of mounted pastoralists. We're finishing with a beautiful Hittite gold bracelet that was discovered accidentally by a farmer plowing his field in the Turkish village of Şitli in March 2022. The bracelet is around 3,300 years old and is the first artifact of its kind ever to be discovered with figural depictions on its surface. On top of that, it's also the first Hittite bracelet ever to be discovered with an elliptical bezel. The shape is known to have been important to the Hittites, but has only previously been seen in their ring seals. We're fortunate that the bracelet survived its encounter with the farming equipment, which left it dented and damaged. It's already undergone some preservation and repair work and will undergo a little more before it's placed on display inside the Korum Archaeological Museum. Enough repair work has been done to determine that the figure at the center of the repas relief is the goddess Ishtar, although the precise meaning or significance of the scene is unknown. Archaeologists carried out an extensive excavation of the field it was found in, but no other artifacts were discovered, so the bracelet's presence in the field is unexplained. Subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications, and you will be the first to know when a new video comes out. Thank you for watching, and see you soon!